When I graduated with my PhD, nobody called themselves the computational social scientist. And I think 2016 was really this turning point where an increasing number of social scientists became interested in internet data. Social media has become a crucial part of the political landscape. How nonsense on one website breaks out to become a trending article on Facebook or Twitter. Studies were trying to get a hold of how much misinformation is out there, how many people are being exposed to it, how many people are, are sharing it, how big of a problem this was. For me, as a, as a social network scientist, a lot of what the web provides is information about the contexts that people are in. If you're getting information about a video, that gets you possibly information about who's shared the video, to an ABC News who is commenting on the video, who likes the video. And so what you can do is you can start a data collection procedure, and then you can do a new round of data collection around those that initial set of videos. Kamala Harris's rapid ascent to the top of the Democratic People who share messages from Democratic candidates and people who share messages from the Republican candidates are very different. You see very little overlap. You see very few influencers or people in general that would retweet a message from a Republican congressional candidate and a Democrat uh, congressional candidate. And so in addition to misinformation, what doesn't get talked about enough is misperceptions. Social media provides a very skewed version of members of the other party. And when you look at how people actually think about issues, we're not that far apart. Yes. If you look at some of the new numbers out suggesting that we Americans agree far more than we disagree on the country's fundamental values. One of the interesting bits of research that I've come across recently is a book called The Other Divide. Typically, when, as political scientists, we think about the divide as being between Republicans and Democrats. And something that has emerged in this divide recently is something called effective polarization, this idea that it's not just issues that we have differences about, but we actually dislike members of the other party. And we've seen that kind of effective polarization grow over time, at least partly as a result of social media. But the other divide is between people who make politics central to their life and people who don't. And it turns out that effective polarization really only exists among people who make politics very central to their life. But many voters don't see politics as the main thing that they care about, the main thing that they're thinking about, the main thing that they're engaging with. There are a host of other things that people are into that fill up their time, their energies, their enthusiasm, than politics. And so I think a lot of these platforms do poor job of putting politics outside of our other interests. Where you see some glimmers of hope are in these spaces that are less devoted to politics. One of the earliest studies about the effect that the internet has on people showed that the internet creates loneliness and depression and a host of other negative outcomes. But that study was overturned in 2001 or 2002, where the scholars agreed that what they had found was not a result of the internet, but a result of using the internet for the first time. It could be that as a society, we're going through an extended version of this kind of growing pain, and that what we're seeing right now is the consequences of a sudden change to the structure of personal connection and personal relationships, but that in 10 or 20 years, we'll look back and say, okay, that was a tough time, but we made it through, and now this tool is just part of our life, but maybe we'll get a little bit better at either sifting it out or creating a space for it that's not all-encompassing.